Preface. I'd never given much thought to how I would die, though I'd had reason enough in the last few months. But even if I had, I would not have imagined it like this. I stared, without breathing, across the long room, into the dark eyes of the hunter, and he looked pleasantly back at me. Surely it was a good way to die, in the place of someone else, someone I loved. Noble, even. That ought to count for something. I knew that if I'd never gone to Forks, I wouldn't be facing death now. But, terrified as I was, I couldn't bring myself to regret the decision. When life offers you a dream so far beyond any of your expectations, it's not reasonable to grieve when it comes to an end. The hunter smiled in a friendly way as he sauntered forward to kill me. Chapter 1. First Sight My mother drove me to the airport with the windows rolled down. It was 75 degrees in Phoenix, the sky a perfect cloudless blue. I was wearing my favourite shirt, sleeveless, white eyelet lace. I was wearing it as a farewell gesture. My carry-on item was a parka. In the Olympic Peninsula of northwest Washington State, a small town named Forks exists under a near constant cover of clouds. It rains on this inconsequential town more than any other place in the United States of America. It was from this town in its gloomy, ever-present shade that my mother escaped with me when I was only a few months old. It was in this town that I'd been compelled to spend a month every summer until I was 14. That was the year I finally put my foot down. These past three summers, my dad, Charlie, vacationed with me in California for two weeks instead. It was to Forks that I now exiled myself. An action that I took with great horror. I detested Forks. I loved Phoenix. I loved the sun and the blistering heat. I loved the vigorous, sprawling city. Bella, my mum said to me, the last of a thousand times before I got on the plane. You don't have to do this. My mum looks like me, except with short hair and laugh lines. I felt a spasm of panic as I stared at her wide, childlike eyes. How could I leave my loving, erratic, hair-brained mother to fend for herself? Of course, she had Phil now, so the bills would probably get paid. There would be food in the refrigerator, gas in her car, and someone to call when she got lost, but still. I want to go, I lied. I'd always been a bad liar, but I've been saying this lie so frequently lately that it sounded almost convincing now. Tell Charlie I said hi. I will. I'll see you soon, she insisted. You can come home whenever you want. I'll come right back as soon as you need me. But I could see the sacrifice in her eyes behind the promise. Don't worry about me, I urged. I'll be great. I love you, Mum. She hugged me tightly for a minute, and then I got on the plane, and she was gone. It's a four-hour flight from Phoenix to Seattle. Another hour in a small plane up to Port Angeles, and then an hour drive back down to Forks. Flying doesn't bother me. The hour in the car with Charlie, though, I was a little worried about. Charlie had really been fairly nice about the whole thing. He seemed genuinely pleased that I was coming to live with him for the first time with any degree of permanence. He'd already gotten me registered for high school, and was going to help me get a car. But it was sure to be awkward with Charlie. Neither of us was what anyone would call verbose, and I don't know what there was to say regardless. I knew he was more than a little confused by my decision. Like my mother before me, I hadn't made a secret of my distaste for forks. When I landed in Port Angeles, it was raining. I didn't see it as an omen, just unavoidable. I'd already said my goodbyes to the sun. Charlie was waiting for me with the cruiser. This I was expecting too. Charlie is police chief swan to the good people of Forks. My primary motivation behind buying a car, despite the scarcity of my funds, was that I refused to be driven around town in a car with red and blue lights on top. Nothing slows down traffic like a cop. Charlie gave me an awkward, one-armed hug when I stumbled my way off the plane. It's good to see you, Bells, he said, smiling as he automatically caught and steadied me. You haven't changed much. How's Rene? Mum's fine. It's good to see you too, Dad. I wasn't allowed to call him Charlie to his face. I only had a few bags. Most of my Arizona clothes were too permeable for Washington. 
My mum and I had pulled our resources to supplement my winter wardrobe, but it was still scanty. It all fit easily into the trunk of the cruiser. I found a good car for you. Really cheap, he announced when we were strapped in. What kind of car? I was suspicious of the way he said good car for you, as opposed to just good car. Well, it's a truck, actually, a Chevy. Where did you find it? Do you remember Billy Black down at La Push? La Push is a tiny Indian reservation on the coast. No. He used to go fishing with us during the summer, Charlie prompted. That would explain why I didn't remember him. I do a good job of blocking painful, unnecessary things from my memory. He's in a wheelchair now, Charlie continued when I didn't respond, so he can't drive anymore, and he offered to sell me his truck cheap. What year is it? I could see from his change of expression that this was a question he was hoping I wouldn't ask. Well, Billy's done a lot of work on the engine. It's only a few years old, really. I hoped he didn't think so little of me as to believe I would give up that easily. When did he buy it? He bought it in 1984, I think. Did he buy it new? Well, no. I think it was new in the early 60s, or late late 50s at the earliest, he admitted sheepishly. Dad, I don't really know anything about cars. I wouldn't be able to fix it if anything went wrong, and I couldn't afford a mechanic. Really, Bella, the thing runs great. They don't build them like that anymore. The thing, I thought to myself. It had possibilities, as a nickname at the very least. How cheap is cheap? After all, that was the part I couldn't compromise on. Well, honey, I kind of already bought it for you. As a homecoming gift. Charlie peeked sideways at me with a hopeful expression. Wow, three. You didn't need to do that, Dad. I was going to buy myself a car. I don't mind. I want you to be happy here. He was looking ahead at the road when he said this. Charlie wasn't comfortable with expressing his emotions out loud. I inherited that from him. So I was looking straight ahead as I responded. That's really nice, Dad. Thanks. I really appreciate it. No need to add that my being happy in folks is an impossibility. He didn't need to suffer along with me. And I never looked a free truck in the mouth. Or engine. Well, now, you're welcome, he mumbled, embarrassed by my thanks. We exchanged a few more comments on the weather, which was wet. And that was pretty much it for conversation. We stared out the windows in silence. It was beautiful, of course. I couldn't deny that. Everything was green. The trees, their trunks covered with moss. Their branches hanging with a canopy of it, the ground covered in ferns. Even the air filtered down greenly through the leaves. It was too green, an alien planet. <laughs> Eventually we made it to Charlie's. He still lived in the small two-bedroom house that he'd bought with my mother in the early days of their marriage. Those were the only kind of days their marriage had, the early ones. There, parked in the street in front of the house that never changed, was my new, well, new to me, truck. It was a faded red colour, with big, rounded fenders and a bulbous cab. To my intense surprise, I loved it. I didn't know if it would run, but I could see myself in it. Plus, it was one of those solid iron affairs that never gets damaged. The kind you see at the scene of an accident, paint unscratched, surrounded by pieces of the foreign car it had destroyed. Wow, Dad, I love it. Thanks. Now my horrific day tomorrow would be just that much less dreadful. I wouldn't be faced with the choice of either walking two miles in the rain to school or accepting a ride in the chief's cruiser. I'm glad you like it, Charlie said gruffly, embarrassed again. It only took one trip to get all my stuff upstairs. I got the west bedroom that faced out over the front yard. The room was familiar. It had been belonged to me since I was born. The wooden floor, the light blue walls, the peaked ceiling, the yellowed lace curtains around the window... These were all a part of my childhood. The only changes Charlie had ever made were switching the crib for a bed and adding a desk as I grew. The desk now held a second-hand computer, with the phone line for the modem stapled along the floor to the nearest phone jack. This was a stipulation for my mother, so that we could stay in touch easily. 
The rocking chair for my baby days was still in the corner. There was only one small bathroom at the top of the stairs, which I would have to share with Charlie. I was trying not to dwell too much on that fact. One of the best things about Charlie is that he doesn't hover. He left me alone to unpack and get settled, a feat that would have been altogether impossible for my mother. It was nice to be alone, not to have to smile and look pleased. A relief to stare dejectedly out the window at this sheeting rain and let just a few tears escape. I wasn't in the mood to go on a real crying jag. I would save that for bedtime, when I would have to think about the coming morning. Fox High School had a frightening total of only 357, now 58, students. There were more than 700 people in my junior class alone back home. All of the kids here had grown up together. Their grandparents had been toddlers together. I would be the new girl from the big city. A curiosity. A freak. Maybe, if I looked like a girl from Phoenix should, I could work this to my advantage. But physically, I'd never fit in anywhere. I should be tan, sporty, blonde, a volleyball player or a cheerleader, perhaps. All the things that go with living in the Valley of the Sun. Instead, I was ivory-skinned, without even the excuse of blue eyes or red hair, despite the constant sunshine. I had always been slender, but soft somehow. Obviously not an athlete. I didn't have the necessary hand-eye coordination to play sports without humiliating myself and harming both myself and anyone else who stood too close. Facing my pallid reflection in the mirror, I was forced to admit that I was lying to myself. It wasn't just physically that I'd never fit in. And if I couldn't find a niche in a school with 3,000 people, what were my chances here? I didn't relate well to people my age. Maybe the truth was that I didn't relate well to people, period. Even my mother, who I was closer to than anyone else on the planet, was never in harmony with me, never on exactly the same page. Sometimes I wondered if I was seeing the same things through my eyes that the rest of the world was seeing through theirs. Maybe there was a glitch in my brain. But the cause didn't matter. All that mattered was the effect. And tomorrow would be just the beginning. <laughs>